Good afternoon, Code Green, Sink Tech Hawaii. I am Howard Wig, your proud host, and I have as my guest today somebody who may be known to <laughs> some of you, although he may have just uh, arrived via the beach a few days ago. His name is Jay Fidel, and we will be talking today about climate change from a global aspect and then what we're doing in Hawaii to mitigate that climate change, specifically with the reduction of uh, CO2 carbon dioxide emissions. So welcome to the program, Oh, Jay. thank you. Thank you, Howard, for yeah. having me on. Yeah. I really enjoy your program. <laughs> okay. <laughs> First and foremost, climate change. I am assuming that we have a pretty gosh darn sophisticated audience here, and you are familiar with the CO2 emissions, at first we, we measure them in parts per billion, and when the concern first started, we were at about 560, then we went up to 580, and environmentalists said things are really looking bad. Guess what? We're up around 400 parts now, and indeed, things are looking bad. If you know glaciers at all, they are all receding. You remember Ernest Hemingway's tale about the leopard frozen on the upper slopes of Kilimanjaro? Well, that leopard would be pretty toasty these days. Those glaciers in which the leopard was frozen are utterly, completely gone, and are so many other glaciers throughout the world. We have Glacier National Park in Montana. How long will it be around? I personally have hiked Mount Rainier many times, which has 17 glaciers. Every one of them, I can personally attest, is receding. People now make a tourist attraction of Alaska to see how far different glaciers have receded from the coastline. And, if that's not enough news for you, as huge chunks of the Greenland ice flow are flowing into the ocean, they are going down, down, down deep into the ocean, changing the temperature of the deep water and therefore changing the current of the current vector of the <clears throat> Gulf Current, and incidentally, just for your information, Gulf Current was discovered by Benjamin Franklin in approximately 1788. Being a good scientist, as he was floating to France to become the ambassador there, he would dip his thermometer via rope into the Atlantic Ocean, and he noticed dramatic changes in the temperature. There was some cold and some much warmer, and he was the first to conjecture that the Gulf Current did indeed exist. Well, we no longer have the Gulf Current that Benjamin Franklin has, and we are seeing changes, especially in the Northwest United States. I was there for Hurricane Sandy, and in the East Coast of Canada. Enough of all this good news. Hey, that's just an introduction to climate change. What, what uh, take do you have on things? Well, I was thinking you while had, you yeah. were talking, Howard, that, <clears throat> you know, it's, for some people it's not settled yet. You mm -hmm. know, when this first came up, which was, um, I mean, in, in sort of in a serious, serious discussion, was only about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. maybe 15 at the outer limit. At the outer limit, I think it was more like 10. And there were some uh, United States senators out of the, uh, out of the, the South and uh, Midwest who truly believed there was no climate change mm -hmm. um, and argued against it and attacked the scholars who mm -hmm. uh, advocated for you know, action to uh, ameliorate climate change. I mean, it was personal ad hominem mm -hmm. attacks. On, mm -hmm. I recall a number of teachers in the University of California were attacked about this. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we don't have that anymore, but we still have naysayers. Uh, and I was thinking while you were describing the state of affairs that 
there are still naysayers. And, and although they're certainly not a majority and they're certainly not going to um, you know, be the leaders on the issue, they still have an effect on it. Mm -hmm. And I think they're, you know, the fact that they advocate against the possibility of climate change makes people who have already decided that there is climate change makes them a little less action oriented, mm -hmm. a little more complacent. Mm -hmm. And that's the, you know, that's the net effect of these people who still won't give in, who still believe that there is no climate change. And some of them are educated people too. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really frightening. So you know, what, what I get out of it is, yes, we have a serious problem. But as I mentioned when we spoke on the phone recently, uh, precious little is actually being done. Mm -hmm. And we spoke about uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg mm -hmm. in, in the mm -hmm. final days of his administration in New York City. Did some dramatic things. Yeah. But aside from Bloomberg, you know, how much physical infrastructure is being built in this country you know, to protect our cities mm -hmm. and, and the other infrastructure that keeps us going? Not that much. So I think what we have is a scientific community that still hasn't fully, you know, persuaded people that they have to take action. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Oh, heavens to Betsy, yes. Yeah, I have the good pleasure of hanging around with a lot of scientists, and they're great, great researchers. They are not such great communicators. If they were great communicators, we would have a heck of a lot more action on the table right now. You mentioned uh, U.S. Senators. There's a senator from Oklahoma, I think his name is in Inhofe. And a few years ago, his famous phrase was, climate change is bunk. And I don't know if he still adheres to that, but yeah. he, he was uh, he's an influential, he's a senior uh, senator. And they also cite different studies that show that there is a great doubt about climate change, but when you look at the origin or the funding for those studies, lo and behold, a huge majority of them have funding from the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> the statistic I like to cite is the fact that 97% of all Nobel Prize winners totally agree that climate change is right here, right now, totally real. And for these people, the deniers, too, talk against 97% of Nobel Prize winners is the, the height of hubris, I, I think. To think that it is not real. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's almost a religious aspect to it. Well, I mean, I think a lot of the people who deny climate change are doing it on a religious basis, something cultural mm -hmm. in the religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the other, the other part that is religious, it's, it's that this is actually a test. It's a test mm -hmm. of, of humanity. It's a test of, of the world, of all the people in all the countries on the world, to see if we can work together and ameliorate mm -hmm. the climate change. And if we can, it'll be, it'll be uh, you know, a statement that mankind, womankind, is perfectible. Mm -hmm. If we can't, mm -hmm. well, it'll be the opposite. Mm -hmm. And it will have the most incredibly destructive effect on our society and our lives. The planet will simply not be able to support as many people as it supports now. And that means huge numbers of people will die. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be the worst, the worst possible catastrophe. Yeah. And I don't think people understand that. Uh, and that's, that's a great concern that this test, this biblical test we mm -hmm. have before us may prove that we are, as a group, inadequate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it very well could. I have been in this industry for more years than most people have been on the planet. And I know with absolute certainty these facts, and I get, as you put it, a lot of doubt about it. And I, I like the religious aspect, too. I find that the conservative wing of the Christian party or the Christian religion is also anti-climate change, whereas the more liberal wing of uh, Christianity is absolutely adamant about climate change. Several denominations 
have it in their mission statement that they shall do everything within the church and personally to ameliorate climate change as much as they can. And as far, far as destructive effects go, we will talk about some of those mm -hmm. uh, specifically uh, later. Yeah. Well, and so the question really, I mean, when you get down to it is, the rest of the world uh, has its thing and we in Hawaii have our thing. Mm -hmm. And on, on, on two sides of it, you know, one is of course, uh, you know, contributing to the continuing, uh, you know, uh, uh, descent of, of the climate, you know, mm -hmm. of, of the, the damage to the planet. Um, and, and I don't think we do too badly at that. We, we still use fossil fuel. But we're a small market, and we're, we're going into clean energy, and that's positive. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we contribute in great ways to, you know, the uh, decline of the environment. Uh, but, but to some extent we do, I mean, and, and we have to stop that. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have any effect on, say, China, which may be contributing a lot more, or the U.S., the mainland U.S., may be contributing a lot more, mm -hmm. uh, and other places in the world, uh, for whatever reasons, you know, whether they see themselves as developing countries that really need to do this to catch up or they don't have the money to do it anyway but the old conventional way with coal and whatnot um, the world is the world is not within our control mm -hmm. all we can do is do our own thing you know mm -hmm. decency begins at home yeah. uh, and I think uh, you know I think that Hawaii has that we we care enough that over the next few years um, it'll be you know it'll be okay here mm -hmm. I wish it were faster I wish yep. we were going, and you yep. too, I mean, we've talked about this, that, that clean energy would come right now, right now, this year, mm -hmm. right now, but it's not coming right now. Um, the other aspect, though, which is actually more, calls for more action, and the action gives you, you know, a greater chance of survival, if you will, mm -hmm. is to build infrastructure that will protect your cities, your civilization, you know, from damage. Uh, because of the, of the decline of the environment. Um, very complex because we don't know the domino theory about what, what happens. You know, for example, if, if you rise, if the sea, le sea level temperature rises by X percent, we don't really know what happens. Mm -hmm. We don't know about the effects on the reefs. We don't know if the reefs, you know, will affect something else. We don't know how the fish will do. We don't know um, how the basic plankton fundamentals of, of the, bio, mm -hmm. the biosphere mm -hmm. in, in the ocean will do. Uh, and it could have effects that surprise us. And mm -hmm. you, know, you know you won't like those effects. They're all bad. Um, we don't know, uh, you know, we don't know how the earth will change. We don't know, you know, how, what, what kind of microbes will grow under our feet. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just a million questions. And it's very hard to figure out what you can do to stop that. But the immediate things, and this goes back to Bloomberg in New York, is so you, you, at least you want to keep the water out of your roads mm -hmm. and out of your sewers and out of your water mm -hmm. supply, your fresh water supply. So you've got to do something at the, at the ocean's edge. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that won't be very good for tourism, but at least it will keep our society functioning. And that's what Bloomberg was all about, mm -hmm. and that's what we should be all about. But look around Howard and look for one single sign of the physical, you know, building of infrastructure to protect us from sea level rise, and you don't see anything, not a thing, nothing. And that troubles me because what it tells me is that people are not convinced that they live in a world of complacency. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you mentioned to me, I think this is really worth talking about, is that it was not a campaign issue for any mm -hmm. candidate in this election. Mm -hmm. Too late now for them to change their minds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, election day is tomorrow, but it's remarkable that this thing which, which yep. you know, portends yep. the possibility yep. of, of, you know, destroying our society here in Hawaii, nobody raises it as a campaign issue, which means that nobody's gonna do anything about it once they're elected. Uh, this is very scary, the lack of political will. Okay, and um, you know, that's, that's where we are. We have no political will to do it and query what has to happen before we do it. You know, I think you can take it as an axiom that if we wait to a certain point to do it, mm -hmm. if we wait to be inundated, then it won't be doable. 
-hmm. if, if you wait to, for the water to creep up your ankles, you won't be able to fix it, or at least fixing it will be much more expensive, yep. much more difficult, much more you know, fraught with risk and complexity. Yep. So I see this as the biggest single problem. Absolutely, and you have given us much to talk about after we take a very brief break from Think Tech Hawaii. Ted Ralston, folks, host of our show at Think Tech Hawaii called Where the Road Leads, where we talk about technology influencing the future of Hawaii. Technology, of course, is the art of solving problems. We always bring in interesting and informed guests who can see from different perspectives and different points of view how that future might unfold and how technology can assist us in getting there. So once again, join us 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Fridays. Uh, Ted Ralston, your host. And please, if you have ideas that you'd like us to address on this show or folks who you think should be on it, let us know. Good afternoon again. Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. I have today with me a surprise guest who may be known <laughs> to some of you, Jay Fidel. And Jay, recently we're talking about climate change and he raised a whole bunch of questions. For one thing he said, well, maybe here in Hawaii we're so small we don't make that much of an impact. Yes, we are very small, but we're a first world country. The world has been focused on Liberia, Sierra Leone, and so forth with the Ebola crisis. And one of the facts that came out was that the entire nation of Liberia, which I have been to, consumes less than one third, I hope you're sitting down, of the peak electrical consumption of the new Dallas Cowboys Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> there is a huge difference between energy consumption in the developing world and with us in the first world. So yes, we do make an impact. If we, I don't know, if you looked at the energy consumption of Hawaii and then drew a great big circle around West Africa, we would, that circle would be pretty gosh darn huge in terms of equivalent energy uh, footprint. On the issue of West Africa, though, Ebola may or may not be a good mm -hmm. example, but if you raise temperature in the world, <clears throat> in the sea or on the land, you're opening the door to new microbes or mm -hmm. to the success of microbes that previously were not a threat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you can have all kinds of Ebolas come mm -hmm. out uh, and, do, and do this kind of, uh, you know, systemic problem. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, the whole Ebola experience is, is a lesson, again, perhaps biblical, uh, that we should be learning from this. We should realize um, that with increase in, in, sea, in, uh, in temperature around the world, mm -hmm. we're going to have new experiences and they're going to be something like Ebola. Yeah, and they're not going to be pleasant. Uh, just as an instance of that, the incidence of malaria is going north, 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 and I'm in the building codes industry, and termites are likewise going north, north, north on the mainland. They used to be confined just to the southern tier. They're creeping up into the middle United States. They don't like cold weather. So yeah, there, there's another there is. example yeah, of that. You also mentioned China. China has 1.3 billion people. We hit, in Hawaii, you have 1.3 million. That sounds like a ratio to me of 1,000 to 1. And they were, for a while, building a new coal plant, something like every 30 days. And those coal plants were old-fashioned, polluting-type coal plants. That's the not-so-good news. The good news is that the pollution from those coal plants has become so horrendous that China has done a radical shift in a way that we in a democracy cannot shift. And they are going way, 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 way over towards photovoltaic industry. They are just putting the photovoltaics out like mad and trying not to build any more coal plants. <coughs> and there are contrary views to that. They are also building eight-lane highways and as soon as they're built, they become clogged up with automobiles as the Chinese population gets richer and richer and richer and moves to 
a much higher carbon footprint type of society. And if that's not enough good news, then we get India. India also has easily 100 million people who have moved from very, very low standards of living to something that resembles a middle class standard of living with commensurate uh, energy consumption. However, their infrastructure is so bad they often have blackouts, so <laughs> they're, they're not. They <laughs> that makes it less the... <laughs> troublesome. <laughs> yeah. But how, you know, how can you get countries that are developing, that are behind the U.S. in infrastructure and quality of life mm -hmm, and all mm -hmm. that, how can you get them to give up the one uh, avenue they have to catch up with us, mm -hmm. that is energy? You know, I suppose, I suppose one element here is that if somebody could invent, and I know you're into this, um, energy, you know, cheap uh, energy, omnipotent, I mean, um, uh, uh, every, uh, ubiquitous energy, mm -hmm. where everyone can have as much energy as he or she wants mm -hmm. at a cheap price, then by definition you have a, a society that is, that is a, having a better economy, that moves mm -hmm. ahead. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think energy is getting more expensive in many places, certainly in Hawaii, uh, even though it goes down and it's down now. Uh, but, you know, I think that if you had cheap energy, cheap green energy, mm -hmm. uh, you could turn this around. It's just that we don't have that yet, and I'm sure India is using a lot of coal, just like China, and they're pumping. It's not so much that they have pollution, but they're pumping all that greenhouse mm -hmm. into the Precisely. air and doing yeah. Yeah. horrendous damage to the environment, mm -hmm. some of which is really not going to be reversible mm -hmm. for a long time. Long time. So, so how, do you, how do you get them off that track? That would really okay. help if we could get them off that track. One word, leapfrog. First, England went through all of its industrial revolution and became the empire builder of the world. Then we followed suit. Historically, we went through our industrial revolution. The developing countries, because technology is so sophisticated now, does not have to go through the industrial revolution. They can leapfrog from being basically a Neolithic society, just barely scraping by with agriculture, to a, an electrified society first and foremost with PVs, photovoltaics. What's going on in a lot of Indian villages and in a lot of the rest of the third world that don't, where they don't have electricity is people are coming in, these are uh, nonprofit organizations, with photovoltaic panels and my favorite LED lamps. They're hooking them up and previously where there was darkness at night now people have an LED lamp or two in their huts. The women can cook at night and kids can do their homework at night. You expand those LEDs as a demand for electricity goes up and voila, you've got clean energy. And the productivity of your photovoltaic cells is going up and the cost is going down. This is part of my Ain't Technology Wonderful philosophy. So in many, many instances, we don't need to go through the fossil fuel burning process. How do you make them transform? How do you make a country, not your country, the other guy's country, mm -hmm. how do you make him transform? Right now, it's being transformed by nonprofits coming in and offering these villages, these, these countries, free stuff. Everybody likes free stuff. Oh, another example is cooking stoves, where traditionally you gather a lot of wood and you make an old-fashioned fireplace the way we made as Boy Scouts, and that's how you do your cooking. And very often it's inside of a hut, so you've got all this smoke. In addition to a lot of fossil fuel or a lot of wood burning, now they're being distributed a certain type of cooking stove that uses only about one-third as much wood to cook the equivalent meal. Some guys in Silicon Valley, I saw something about that. Mm -hmm, Americans mm -hmm. who thought up a um, you know, highly efficient um, material and design um, to be, you know, to, to be used in the third world. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but how, you know, and and of course, it's cheap. Uh, but 
you still have to buy them and deliver them and mm -hmm. convince people to use them and get by any kind of uh, you know corruption and, or government opposition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when first world countries want to help third world countries, third world governments don't let them do that or they take the benefits for the individual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know politicians and officials. Um, so how do you get by all of that and you actually make the conversion in a given country that really needs these stones mm -hmm. uh, so that every family has a stove like this? That would make a difference. That would make a difference. And there are a lot of NGOs, non-governmental organizations, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They're, they're active in this world. They get boots on the ground. And those boots on the ground march into the villages and train the villagers in this new technology. They completely bypass the powers that be in, in the capital city. I am reminded of John F. Kennedy. Uh, I'm reminded of the Peace Corps, which was such a noble and wonderful experiment. It really took us to uh, another uh, bright place. It's one of those memorable things about his uh, short administration that, that you can you know, look back with admiration. Um, don't we need that today? Uh, sort of a Peace Corps of energy. Absolutely, energy Corps. Yeah. <laughs> energy Corps, yeah. And we would be talking hundreds of thousands of people not just Americans, but certainly Canadians, Europeans, Japanese, any, anywhere in the, the first world, the, the developed world. There are a lot of idealistic people out there. I get great pleasure talking to young people who want to march out there and change the world and green the world. And when you can harness that young energy and train them what to do and then put them in third world countries. That's just a marvelous experience for them. And then, of course, the villagers benefit mightily and the climate, likewise, benefits mightily from that. Do you need government? I mean, so, so somebody in, in the nature of John Kennedy could get up there and by the flick of a pen establish, you know, the Energy Corps, although I think some people in Congress would oppose it mm -hmm. because they didn't think it was necessary because they don't think there's any climate change. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but let's assume that it, it gets out there. Do you, you need governmental action, don't you? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, although you know you, we really wish government would sort of go away, mm -hmm. the fact is that uh, you need governmental action to get those stoves into those huts, mm -hmm. teach those people how to use them, and, and have the desired effect. Uh, so how do you how do you um, you know organize this on a government? It's almost like what is the United Nations doing about this? Does there need to be a United Nations of energy here? Uh, mm -hmm. Can't they make this part of their mission? Can't they make this part of their apparatus? Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me it's a natural to have the United Nations to do or organize all of this, you know, like with the uh, Energy Corps and, and, and things like that. Uh, query, do we need another organization or can they do it? That is an excellent question for the last segment of our program, Think Tech Hawaii will be back in a moment. Hi, my name is Seymour Kazimersky. I have a show called Seymour's World on Think Tech Hawaii. Our show is about opening minds and facilitating conversations. To tell you the truth, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. I have no idea who our guests are going to be, but I guarantee you we're going to have lots and lots of fun. Aloha from Seymour's World. Good afternoon again, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. My guest is somebody who may be known to you, Jay Fidel. We were talking most recently about possibly the UN or possibly the US establishing an energy core similar to the Peace Corps, where I've had the good fortune to meet many, many, many idealistic young people get them trained, pay them a very minimal salary, and get them out into the developing countries so they can leapfrog from a very, very simple type of existence to having at least an electrified village at little or no energy cost whatsoever. Now, what would it take to create an energy core since President Obama is very busy 
bypassing Congress, since he can't get anything done through Congress, I wonder if he could just by the stroke of a pen create an energy core also. It wouldn't uh, cost all that much. We have the Peace Corps as, as a model. And these would be people doing the same things, just focusing on, on energy efficiency or, or renewable sources. Another possibility is the UN. They are supposed to be benefiting all of humanity. Why not a UN energy core? That excellent, excellent idea. If anybody out there can do that, please make it happen. Yeah. Another question that we brought up was that of a carbon tax, where we lament the fact that we're paying close to $4 a gallon for gasoline. Jimmy Carter, many, many years ago, proposed a gasoline tax, and it was shot down. And as a result, in very, very indirect ways, the oil exporting company, oil exporting companies were able to raise, raise, raise the cost of oil from $10 a barrel to $100 a barrel. At one point a few years ago, it went up to $147 a barrel. Result, we're paying instead of $1.50, $2 a gallon, we're paying over $4 a gallon in many cases. Had we imposed an energy tax all those long years ago, that would have suppressed the demand for oil. People would have been buying fuel-efficient cars and doing things to reduce their electricity use, and we might not be in this pickle we are today. So I don't think people uh, realize the emergence, the emergency aspect of the situation. You know, uh, I remember uh, my wife and I were out for dinner with uh, another couple, and the other couple mentioned that they had just come back from seeing Al Gore's movie. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it? An inconvenient Truth. truth. Yep. That has to be 10 years also. Mm -hmm. Well, just about 10 years ago. And I stood up. No joke, Howard. I stood up in the middle of the dinner, and I said to my wife and the, and the couple that we were having the dinner with, i got to go. I must see this movie. You guys, you know, finish and have dessert. I'll meet you later. I must see this movie now. And I did. I went right to the Varsity Theater, and I saw this movie. I had to see it. Um, the movie, I'm sure, is still powerful, although, uh, you know, he gave a speech not too long ago at the university in the, uh, in the stadium there. Uh, it was actually in support of Brian Schatz, <laughs> mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and it was uh, sort of an update about his movie, and it was really quite scary. Mm -hmm. But I don't think people understand the scariness. Uh, and what would be good, I think, is if somebody would sort of model the way the scientists do at SOWEST, there's a lot of scientists modeling various mm -hmm. aspects of climate change, model you know, what it means to lose the glaciers, what it means, the degree of, you know, of additional uh, of heat in the oceans and on the land, uh, what it means to have weather that is unpredictable, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and show us all that in X years we're going to have a different state of affairs, and, and every day that ticks by is a critical day. And, you know, we will be visited by these catastrophes, but our kids will have lots mm -hmm. more of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in Hawaii, I, I think we're totally complacent uh, with the fact that we're in, in the path of weather that is changing. And we've had some rough storms in the past, but those mm -hmm. storms are likely to be much rougher in the future. Mm -hmm. And we haven't, you know, the, 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 rule of, uh, the rule of random variables, you know, uh, every day that goes by, we're closer to having one. Mm -hmm. Every every nice, every good weather day is closer to a bad weather day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one of these days, we're going to learn the hard way. And I think somebody has to make the point in advance, not when it's too late. And maybe it's another Al Gore movie. Maybe it's some scientists showing you that that there's a there really is a day of judgment out there, and it's not that far away. And uh, therefore, you know, make it clear that every elected mm -hmm. official has to address this. Nicholas Taleb, the author of Black Swan, and the premise of that book is that it is the unexpected huge events that really turn the tide of history. And one of these days, Hawaii is going to have a Black Swan event, only it's not going to be unexpected because those of us who study the subject know it's coming. We're yeah. just not uh, preparing for it. And there is a professor 
at the university. I'm sure he's been on the program here, uh, Chip Fletcher. Sure, he's been on the program. And he has maps of Waikiki. Here's the water level currently, our nice beaches. Here's what happens if the water level rises one foot and suddenly a lot of the shoreline ain't there anymore. Here's what happens if it rises two feet. Uh, some of Waikiki is gone, three feet. It is virtually gone. Waikiki is utterly, totally useless. But you know what? Tourism won't, the, the effect on tourism won't be there at the end of the throw. Mm -hmm. The effect on tourism will be there at the beginning of the throw. Mm -hmm. When it appears that water is coming up on Kalakaua Avenue or whatever you know, the indicator is, mm -hmm. um, then tourism will end long before it gets to be really deadly. Yeah. And so I, mean, I, I think that people, they have this complacency that, well, you can wait until it's real serious before we do anything. Well, mm -hmm. the, psychologically, in the minds of those who would travel here, it's going to happen long before it gets all that serious. Mm -hmm. Somehow that brings to mind the analogy of catching a disease way in the early stages. You check with your doctor, Doc, I ain't feeling so good. Oh my goodness, I see a tiny tumor here, let's cut it out. And boom, you're down the road. You let that tumor grow and grow and grow. It could be life-threatening, or at least it results in a very, very serious operation that puts you on the side for a long time. Similarly with here, the longer we wait to do something, the more serious are going to be the consequences, and the more costly is going to be the damage and our attempts to repair the damage. And you mentioned the goose that lays the golden egg tourism. That is definitely going to be affected. When I was a kid, I could go to Kahala Beach and with my dog, I was a crazy mixed up teenager, I needed some solitude. My dog and I would go to Kahala Beach at sunset and we'd run up way over a mile and we'd run way back and we'd just have the time of our lives. Well, guess what? Kahala Beach ain't no more. There's a very, very, very solid piece of evidence right there. It's, it's thinned down? Is that it's it's sand not, is gone? not existence, yeah. It's the, the water level's higher. Yeah, and the, there are a lot of the homeowners built stone walls to protect themselves. The stone walls have the effect of washing the sand up. Right. People yeah. don't realize that. Yeah. You know, and and that, that goes to a point I wanted to make with you. That is, it's not as simple as building a wall, well, mm -hmm. like a, a dike. Uh, in Louisiana or in uh, in Holland, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. You have to really be smart. You have to figure out how to prevent, uh, you know, this natural thing from happening, and at the same time, you know, uh, avoid this rock wall effect that you're talking about, and at the same time, not panic the tourists. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, psychology mm -hmm. plays into this yeah. thing big yeah. time, yeah. and so we don't have an answer on that. Mm -hmm. We don't have a system on that. I don't know if anybody's even working on that. Maybe, maybe Sol West is working yeah. on that. But the problem is um, it has to be well thought out. It has to be the best that our science can provide. Otherwise, it's going to have dastardly effects. Mm -hmm. We think we're solving the problem. We're actually making the problem worse, you know, like that rock wall. Yeah, yeah. As reminds me of northern Japan, the Sendai region, with the subject of that huge, huge, huge earthquake and tsunami, they actually have, I believe it's a 20-foot high wall, very, very thick concrete that they had built against such an event. And I'm sure that that had an ameliorating effect, but the tsunami was so high it just went over that wall and had the devastation, caused the devastation it did. Yeah. So what are we going to do with our infrastructure? I will do my level best to get an expert in here on my possibly my next program to discuss exactly what we're doing oh, with, with our do. infrastructure. Yeah. yeah, we need yeah. to we need to think about that. We need mm -hmm. to be very creative about it because the likelihood is that any solution take risks mm -hmm. losing the beaches and therefore tourism. Mm -hmm. You know, Hawaii without beaches, it's it's a hard sell. Mm -hmm. um, and once people stop because they decide that you know we're going down like Majuro. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. the, the water is going to, you know, flow over our most precious assets. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to come back, and and 
at the very moment that we need the cash the most, mm -hmm. that we need to spend billions to protect our, our homes, our businesses, our lives, uh, at the very moment when we need the money, we won't have any industry to derive the money. What, yeah. a, what a set yeah. of set facts. You know? yep. And we'll be playing unemployment insurance like mad too. All these people out of uh, work. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, now's the time. Uh, I don't know how do you how do you get people to think about this, Howard? How do you how do you change the way the system works? There are lots of issues like this, you know, that are time mm -hmm. sensitive that we really need to attend to. But this is the one that has the greatest effect mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. I have come to the conclusion that the human brain is wired for the short term, not the long term. I have a theory that that the political brain, you have, you have the public brain, then you have the political mm -hmm. brain, and for sure that's the way the political brain is wired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I have a theory that uh, Caveman A came out of his cave, looked around, and said, "Hmm, plenty danger here, plenty danger. Saber-toothed tiger, saber-toothed tiger." Looks around, and sure enough, there's a saber-toothed tiger peeking around a rock and he dashes back into his cave and he's safe. But on the other hand, there's a long-term sinker. And he's out there saying, you know, my wife has all this firewood she needs to burn. What if I got a bunch of vertical rocks, made a circle, and we cooked in there? We could save all of that heat from going out. It would go up. We'd need a lot less firewood. We'd be in much better shape. And as he's thinking about this, Saber-toothed tiger peeks around, see the man totally distracted, pounces on him, and he's gone. And there, there goes your long-term uh, gene pool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he should pay more attention to the saber-toothed tiger. Yes, yes. <laughs> and that's true. I mean, if we perceive that there is a saber-toothed tiger on our doorstep, yeah. mm -hmm. we're not going to be thinking much about climate change because that's, you know, decades away mm -hmm. more. So this is, and that's the problem. It's yep. a short-term view yep. of things. It's, yep. it's a human condition thing. Our, our saber-toothed tiger is going to be when a huge, huge storm hits us and pretty well devastates us. And the scientists can prove to us that this is related to climate change. And on that extremely positive note, <laughs> it is time to bid fond farewell. Thank you, guest Jay Fidel, Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green, Howard Wig. See you in two weeks. Thank you, Howard.